Okay, so we're going to sing a song in praise to our Redeemer. I see, see the show arriving as we speak. Okay, 468, song number 468, A Child of the King. If you do not know that you're a child of the King, you need to go, you need to go check down the adoption office and find out because you are indeed daughters and sons of the King. We're going to sing all these verses today. My father is rich in houses or lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. 468. My Father's own Son, the Savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now he is pleading for sinners on high and will give me a home when he comes by and by. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the, the king. king. Change of plans, verse 4. A tent or a cottage, oh, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing all glory to God. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. A child of the King. With Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. So how many of you guys really like hymns? How many of you prefer contemporary music? You can raise your hand. I like contemporary music. Lorena was playing a song, uh, the spirit song. Oh, let the sun. Of... I love that song. That's a contemporary song. There's a lot of good contemporary songs. As we look at the hymns, though, we notice that times have changed a little bit. Uh, we sang a song this morning, Redeemed. The last verse used to sound, go like this. And soon with the spirits made perfect. At home with the Lord I shall be. The Adventist hymnals changed that to, and soon with the saints. So you see the people were singing this song 100 years ago, 150 years ago, were thinking, uh, when we die, we become spirits and we go to heaven. And so, of course, we tried to help rectify that theology a little bit by changing even just one word. That's why the hymns are beautiful, because sometimes all it takes is just one word. And we can restore, restore the biblical truths that they are. Um, so I would like us to turn now over to song number 466. We'll do at least one more. Song number 466, Wonderful Peace. Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight Rolls a melody sweeter than song In celestial like strains it unceasingly falls O'er my soul like an infinite calm Peace, peace, one 
coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in the fathomless billows of love. What a treasure I have in this wonderful peace, buried deep in my innermost soul, so secure that no power can drive it away, while the years of eternity roll. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down. First page 466. Worry so without gladness or comfort or rest, passing down the rough pathway of time. Make the Savior your friend, there the shadows grow dark. Oh, this this be so sublime. pray. Thank you, Father, for the blessing the Sabbath day has been for us, Lord. We can't thank you enough. We know that in your wisdom, you gave us the Sabbath so that we could rest mind, soul, and spirit. And thank you, Lord, for that. Bless us today as we continue to bury ourselves in these amazing, amazing concepts that you've given us in your second book, Nature. In Jesus' name, amen. Right. This guy is a lot of fun to sing with. Because we get up and sing, you might not notice this, but when we're singing the first verse, he's singing lead. In the next verse, we don't, even, we don't even communicate. I just start singing lead, he starts singing harmony. So we're flipping back and forth, yeah. sometimes right in the middle of the verse, sometimes at the chorus. So just so you know, uh, a few weeks from now, a month from now, on the November 5, uh, my group One Voice is coming back. And Ben's the latest addition to the group. He sung once awesome. in a couple of chor uh, concerts with us and then came COVID and the devil did his best to keep us sometimes I think he just started COVID just to stop us <laughs> but uh, we're going to break out anyway so we're looking forward to that and uh, we welcome you to come back on November 5 it'll be uh, song, music concerts all day from Sabbath school through to Vespers we're happy to have our guests with us uh, this is lecture number four. four and the brave ones came back before supper all right mm -hmm. If you come for the 431, you get supper free. Those who, <laughs> who didn't arrive didn't know that they're going to have to pay, right? No. It's free for everybody. Come on up, Dr. Right. Ryan. And we're so glad to have your driver with you today. Oh, yeah. It's so great. Susie? Yeah, right. So glad Susie. that she was able to drive us around. And we had another driver this afternoon. Thank you, John, with uh, taking us a little tour around their property. And yeah, Ben, I, I didn't know, man. That's some good singing. That, I, that sounded great, you guys. We're uh, just, yeah, very, very impressed. Very nice. Um, wow, it is great to be back. Thank you. Great lunch, great conversation, a lot of smiling faces. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about how God has designed us to have life. And, and uh, it's pretty amazing. And so we'll try to have some fun things here to do uh, as well. So people have asked about our family. So I wanted to show, this is one of my slides I have our, our family. And... Uh, you, we were, all, see, we often wear the same things. That day we were all wearing our yellow shirts from uh, Camp Timber Ridge in Indiana, where we often do some talks. I don't know if anybody's been there. And so uh, one of the big things that happened this year is that my son got taller than me. He's, and he, he's 14. And this was like the greatest accomplishment that he's ever had in his life, that he's taller than dad. 
And like, well, you, all you did was sleep and eat for that. <laughs> but he was so proud of it. And, uh, and then I shrunk a little bit somewhere in there, too. So uh, he, he did. So, yeah, Carter, 14, uh, just started high school. Christiana there, uh, 12 years old, 7th grade. And Cadence, uh, uh, 10, 10 years old, 5th grade. So they would have been here. They would have been doing these things. Uh, and they have been for uh, just many years. And they're awesome kids. And so very blessed there. And uh, some of the things, yeah, sometimes kids call me Dr. Bubbles. I forgot about that because when my kids are here, because that's a little easier. It, it seems like when I'm doing stuff with chemistry, there's often bubbles. Not today, though. There haven't been too many bubbles. So um, there we go. And we always carry our map of Michigan. Is there a map of Minnesota that's like that? And they hand, see, yeah, see, this is why Michigan, we have some really cool things. And we're down there with the little red dots and uh, seven hours away. So it's great to be here. And uh, I mentioned this this morning. I thought, well, we got to do this experiment here um, about having, uh, we're scientists, the chemist in the Bible. And we, I wanted to show you that because that will lead into our experiment first. But uh, for, uh, before we do that, I wanted to do something, because we're going to talk about something that's in the air. Can, can you guys tell me what's in the air? What are, what are some of the chemicals? I, I call everything a chemical. Water's a chemical. You know, what are some things in the air, young man? Oxygen. Very good. We're going to talk about that here today. Can you guys think of anything else that's in the air? Yes. Carbon dioxide. All right. What else? Is there anything else in our air? Yeah. About 1% argon. Yes, about 1% argon. And there's dust. What did you say? Nitrogen. Man, I think I need to come back and give a talk about nitrogen here. Yeah, is there anything else? Uh, there's not much helium unless you lost, lost your balloon. And then, and then, there, then there's some helium. Man, I, I need to come back and talk to you guys about the air some more. That's what I did last time. There's some amazing things. So this time I was kind of going deep inside of us. And, uh, but I want to do at least a little bit with air. Uh, is there anything else in our air? So, wait, what's the, where, what is there the most of? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Does anybody know the percentage? Close. 78% nitrogen. Most of our air is nitrogen. How much oxygen? 21. 21% 21 nitrogen, 78% nitrogen. Add those two numbers up, and you get 99%. Most of our air is those two ingredients. And why? In the investigating, that's awesome. I've learned so much. And, you know, it's uh, interesting now with the James Webb Telescope. Has anybody heard of the James Webb Telescope? Raise your hand. Okay, cool. Uh, they have put some special detectors on that telescope that they can look and see some molecules in other planets' atmospheres. But unfortunately, it can't see nitrogen and oxygen. It can see some of the other things, water, carbon dioxide. And it'll be interesting. We're going to see how common it is, common it is to see uh, what other planets have in their air. Because not every planet is not like Earth. There's no oxygen on Mars or Venus or Jupiter or Saturn or any of the planets in our solar system. They don't have oxygen. Now, some may argue... Does anybody know there, there's actually a tiny bit of oxygen on one of the planets? Mercury has just a like, tiny bit. It's not even enough to do anything with. It's, there's hardly any atmosphere on Mercury, but there's, and there's a tiny amount of oxygen. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. But I thought I'd do a, a demonstration here. And we need a, because it's always nice to see. Does anybody know what I got inside of this flask right here? <laughs> what, do, what, do you, what do you kids think? What's in there? What do you, air? What, are you, what were you going to say? No, you were going to say nothing, weren't you? Because it looks like there's nothing in there. But there's air in there and a lot of amazing things. You, someone want to come and I need a, a, a help. So you want to come help one of you guys? You can come up here. All right. And all I want you to do, it's not, it's not too hard, is just blow this in. You, you, I, yeah, you guys can just blow it in there. Okay. <laughs> I, oh, I, I said blow it in. Okay, try it one more time. Try one more time. Let me get it up. Oops, let me get it right here so you can 
easily blow it in. <laughs> what is going on, young man? Okay, oh, you want to try? Okay. It just, it's pretty easy, just blow it in. I'll try a little harder. <laughs> what is going on? It, it, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Do you want to try? Come try one more time. There you go. Oh, you, that's, you know, oh man. Okay. Blow it in. It's see. Come on, you guys. No, it's. You, thank you for your help. Give them a hand, you guys. Yeah, you did exactly what you're supposed to. It's. It seems like a trick. It goes right in. But even when I blow on it, it comes right out. It seems like magic, but it's just understanding our air and the oxygen and the nitrogen that's there. And it seems like magic that scientists are doing these things. It's not magic. I just understand and try to understand what you can do with air. That's called the Bernoulli effect. When, it, when you blow, see, when I'm dropping it, gravity is pushing it in. Oh, I can't even hit. Don't tell my basketball team. I just missed this, the easiest shot in the world there. All right, so I can put it in, but I can push it in with my finger, no problem. But when I try to push it with air, thinking with my breath, I'm actually lowering this pressure. Moving air is low pressure. So I, I'm actually, when I'm blowing it, I lowered the air pressure there. And it's not magic. It's understanding how air works because it's a substance. It's got things in it. And it's easy, uh, it seems kind of easy sometimes as a scientist, you can try to trick people with things. And, uh, oh, where did I do with the other? There was two other chemicals up here. Oh, great scientist. Didn't I bring them out? What? It says uh, blood A and blood B components. Did they get, I thought I brought them out. I think they're in the back there. So you want to go grab them real quick? Yeah. All right, my, uh, the assistant here, and I'll, and I'll tell the story here. I'm going to put a little bit of this. So where are the chemists and the scientists in the Bible? So back in the story of the great plagues that happened on Egypt. Oh, that one's going to, I think it's okay. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you, dear. All right. Where Pharaoh was, he had all of the Hebrews as slaves, right? And God told Moses, go, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And he said, so Moses did. He said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. And uh, Moses said, all right, God's going to have a plague on, on, your, on, your, on, your, on Egypt and on the country. And turned everything into blood. Yeah, thank you. I like to move around. That's probably bad for the cameras. I'm, I am trying to get my steps in today, so... <laughs> And so we're getting there. And so Pharaoh said, oh, uh, get the scientists out here. So, dear, why don't you help me be a scientist here? And, uh, and so Pharaoh said, oh, scientist, I know you're a magician here. And can you, yeah, just put about the same amount in there. Yep, same amount. Nope, same there. Yep. All right, there, that's good. And look, that looks just like water. Hold those up there. And this is probably something that Pharaoh asked the scientists, man, blood? Can we, can't we just make blood? And they said, oh, great, Pharaoh. We can make blood just by mixing these two ingredients right here. Blood is easy, Pharaoh. And they did a trick. Thank you, dear. But it's no trick. I'm just understanding how that, the chemicals in there that seemed invisible, everything seems invisible and you've got to learn how it works. That's what's fun about being a chemist. It seems like magic. But I took something that was made out of iron and I added another compound and with oxygen in the air, all of that together made this red compound. And so I knew that was going to happen and it works every time, especially when you bring the right stuff. And so... Uh, and so we were able to, to make that. And then when, the, when Pharaoh saw, saw that, that hardened his heart. And so sometimes when we hear things from scientists or from other people, we're, well, I guess we don't need God because we, we, we can make it without him. And that's what I want to show you today, something about blood that is so amazing that um, I hope will turn your heart towards him and we will soften our hearts towards God. 
And I'm picking up the wrong remote. We've got a lot of remotes up here. And I'm going to use it. And so we're going to talk about oxygen. And I have a little video here, hopefully it will work, about how oxygen is used in your body. Now, this is not a video our group made. It's pretty cool. I think this is actually a TED Talk uh, video, nice little educational video on uh, the movement of oxygen in your body. Let's see what happens with that. Oop. Okay, I think I'll need a little help, John, on hitting play. You have to slide the mouse there. Thank you. You breathe in about 17,000 times per day. It's a process you rarely think about, but behind the scenes, a huge coordinated effort is playing out. Your vital organs, the gut, brain, bones, lungs, blood, and heart, work together to sustain your life by delivering oxygen to tissues throughout your body. Most of our cells need oxygen because it's one of the key ingredients of aerobic respiration. That's the process that produces a molecule called ATP, which our cells use to power their many incredible functions. But getting oxygen throughout our bodies is a surprisingly difficult task. Gas enters cells by diffusing in from their surroundings, and that only happens efficiently over tiny distances. So, for oxygen to reach the cells within our bodies, it needs a transportation network. This is where our 20 trillion red blood cells come in. Each one contains about 270 million oxygen-binding molecules of hemoglobin, which is what gives blood its scarlet hue. To make these cells, the body uses raw materials that become available from the food we eat. So in some ways, you could say that oxygen's journey through the body really begins in the gut. Here, in an amazing display of mechanical and chemical digestion, food gets broken down into its smallest elements, like iron, the building block of hemoglobin. Iron is carried through the cardiovascular system to the body's hematopoietic tissue. This tissue is the birthplace of red blood cells, and it can be found enclosed within our bone marrow cavities. The kidneys regulate our levels of red blood cells through the release of erythropoietin, a hormone which causes marrow to increase production. Our bodies churn out roughly 2.5 million red blood cells per second, a number equivalent to the entire population of Paris, so that oxygen that makes it to the lungs will have ample transportation. But before oxygen can even reach the lungs, the brain needs to get involved. The brainstem initiates breathing by sending a message through your nervous system all the way to muscles of the diaphragm and ribs. This causes them to contract, thus increasing the space inside the rib cage, which allows the lungs to expand. That expansion drops your lungs' internal air pressure, making air rush in. It's tempting to think of our lungs as two big balloons, but they're actually a lot more complicated than that. Here's why. The red blood cells in the vessels within your lungs can only pick up oxygen molecules that are very close to them. If our lungs were shaped like balloons, air that was not in direct contact with the balloon's inner surface couldn't diffuse through. Luckily, our lungs' architecture ensures that very little oxygen is wasted. Their interior is divided into hundreds of millions of miniature balloon-like projections called alveoli that dramatically increase the contact area to somewhere around 100 square meters. The alveolar walls are made of extremely thin, flat cells that are surrounded by capillaries. Together, the alveolar wall and capillaries make a two-cell thick membrane that brings blood and oxygen close enough for diffusion. These oxygen-enriched cells are then carried from the lungs through the cardiovascular network, a massive collection of blood vessels that reaches every cell in the body. If we laid this system out end-to-end -end in a straight line, the vessels would wrap around the earth several times. Propelling red blood cells through this extensive network requires a pretty powerful pump, and that's where your heart comes in. The human heart pumps an average of about 100,000 times per day, and it's the powerhouse that ultimately gets oxygen where it needs to go, 
completing the body's team effort. Just think, this entire complex system is built around the delivery of tiny molecules of oxygen. If just one part malfunctioned, so would we. Breathe in. Your gut, brain, bones, lungs, blood, and heart are continuing their incredible act of coordination that keeps you alive. Breathe out. All right, that's pretty good. Okay, quiz. There'll be a quiz here in a little bit, so I hope you guys are paying attention. No, no quiz. Uh, the, what, why do we need oxygen? We need it for the energy that is there. We'll have one other short little video. It's two minutes uh, in just a second. So that cells and tissues can get oxygen. It's said to help make ATP and get your energy. Well, oxygen does do all of that. And there's just a little bit more. And I'm just not satisfied with just saying you're, you need oxygen to live and you get energy from it. I wanted to know more, a, a little bit more details, and I found some very interesting things that I want to share with you this afternoon. So I need to do one more video here. Sorry, John, uh, if you could uh, roll that one. This one's a much shorter, showing oxygen's role in more detail. Our body is made up of trillions of cells. They all require energy to function. This energy is created within our cells, in the mitochondria. Here, food is converted into chemical energy called ATP. ATP is released by the mitochondria, so cells can use it. Mitochondria consist of two membranes, an outer membrane, separating it from the cytosol, and an inner membrane, surrounding the so-called matrix. The area between these membranes is called the intermembrane space. ATP is generated at the inner membrane of mitochondria by an efficient mechanism called oxidative phosphorylation involving several membrane protein complexes. Nutrients provide high energy electrons in the form of NADH, which are used by the protein complexes to pump protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. This continuous pumping creates a proton gradient where the positively charged protons are attracted to the more negative matrix. When the protons re-enter the matrix through the ATP synthase protein complex, they catalyze the production of ATP. Now all of that is happening. All those little machines are working and I've left out a lot of details. But in there you may not have noticed, but oxygen is acting like a janitor, cleaning up a lot of these electrons that get made in this process. And so it just has a simple job of cleanup. I thought it did a lot more than that. But it's, if we didn't have that job, then none of those machines would work in there. All these little machines. So how does the oxygen get from the air through your lungs to where it needs to to do its janitorial job. That doesn't sound too exciting, but it's super important. And I'll, I'll tell you the problem as we go along. It gets carried along in this really big protein made out of amino acids that we talked about last night. That is uh, 64,000 parts here, atoms, it's, it's weight, it's huge. It is 2,000 times bigger than the oxygen. There are four locations in hemoglobin that carry oxygen in this huge thing, according to the oxygen. It'd be the equivalent of saying, hey, let's get a big jumbo jet, and we're going to put four people in it. Does that sound very efficient? No, it doesn't seem efficient at all until you recognize what has to take place in order to carry those four people, the four oxygen molecules. You need something big like that because it has a very special job. So as I've looked deep inside of the hemoglobin to see how it works, there's a special molecule that we call, well, hemoglobin's the big thing. There's this thing called heme that is right in the middle. And this molecule holds iron. Iron has the symbol Fe. That's from the Latin word ferrous. And so the symbol on the periodic table is Fe. And that tricks a lot of people because we'll say, hey, go look for iron. And they're like, okay, well, it starts with an I. Where is it? No, no, it's Fe for iron. 
So that's a good one to remember. So iron can go in the middle of this structure. Now in graduate school, I had to build structures like that, and we would put metals inside of there. And I loved doing it, because it was so easy. And they always went in, and it was like the best part of the synthesis. Making all this other stuff was really hard, and it was messy, and a lot of cleanup, and it was just a lot of work to make the big structure right here. All of this was hard, but putting in the metal, oh, it was the last thing. We'd like, just put in a little bit of the metal solution, and it would go, oh, it was so easy. And then later on, I learned that really any kind of metal can go in there. And in fact, uh, this structure right here is used by plants, and it's chlorophyll. It has a slightly different structure. So the green color in plants comes from something that's very similar shape, but they put magnesium in the middle. Completely different metal. Vitamin B12, we talked about that. Uh, it has a very similar structure as well, but it puts cobalt in the middle. Huh, okay. There's some other cofactors, so they put nickel, and I put zinc in the middle when I was in graduate school. It was super easy to do. And uh, I love doing that part. One of the lessons I've learned is from that, you can put anything, oh, you can put a lot of different metals in there. In fact, I put, read a paper that said it's easier to put other metals in there like vanadium, nickel, and copper. They connect better than anything, uh, these other metals like iron. But our body needs it to have iron in the middle. So how did that happen? There is a machine in there that collects iron and puts it in the middle. If you leave it to chance, you're going to get everything else. You're going to get iron, magnesium, calcium, probably not a lot of vanadium around. You're going to put lots of different things. In your body and in living systems, nothing is left to chance. Because if you do, it won't work. Other things naturally want to go in there and get inserted into that structure. And so your body has all of these little machines to regulate and to do all the job. It would be like if you're a kid, I'm thinking of some of the kids, what if you had a machine that put your socks away? Wouldn't that be nice? Right? And then you had another machine that put your underwear away and folded it nicely. Right? And you had another machine that would fold your pants and put up your clothes on a hanger. The parents are like, where is this thing? Why can't you make that? <laughs> and there's a machine for that. And your room would be nice and clean. Wouldn't that be great? Where are these? These are things you guys can invent later on. But you need to do it. There is an incredible machine that can do all of those things. And it's you. <laughs> okay? We don't need separate machines for the shirts and the underwear and the socks. We got you guys. All right. But this feral chelatase, if it ends in ASE, it's a machine that does a, a very specific task. And all it does is put iron in the middle because if you leave it to chance, it won't work. And it will put iron in every single time. So naturally, it will put all these different metals like nickel, iron, zinc, copper, any of those can end up in the middle. That's natural. Putting iron in every single time is not natural. It is controlled, it's very specific, and it's not left to chance. We will die if it's left to chance, and our body doesn't do that. And so in order to have oxygen, uh, if, if you were to leave it to chance to put oxygen into the air or into, into liquid water, and you can, Oh, this one didn't turn out as well. What color is that? Can you guys see some there? That looks kind of blue. Yeah, but if I shake it some more. Can you guys see it now? Oh, there it goes. Another magic trick. This was using oxygen in the air, and I had a molecule that would turn blue when it experienced some oxygen. And we're going to let it sit there. And eventually the oxygen in the water leaves, and it will turn colorless. So we'll see if that works. Dear, I think you made a pretty good lid. Yeah. All right. I forgot my rubber stopper in there, but that lid works just as good. And so this is called Henry's Law that pushes oxygen from the air into water. But it doesn't push very much oxygen into there. But your body can take that and using red blood cells with iron that holds on to oxygen, and it can do like 100 times almost more oxygen in the same amount of volume as uh, water. So that's natural to put a little bit of oxygen. It is not natural to put a lot of oxygen there. So your blood carries 70 times, oh, it's only 70? 70, 70 times, yeah. 70 times more oxygen over the natural limits 
that's there. So that takes a coordinated effort. Now, who's had the Impossible Burger? Anybody? All right. Now, who likes the Impossible Burger? Oh, you like it? Oh, now, oh, you're, you kind of like it? Yeah. So I grew up eating meat until I was about 14. I was sharing with some of you at lunch that at 14, I decided I was going to go completely vegetarian, and I went to eat meat. And, uh, but they uh, came out with the Impossible Burger, and they said, this tastes like real meat. Well, one of the keys to making meat taste like meat is that uh, it has to have a little blood in it. So how do you get a vegetarian meat-like product and get blood from something else that's not an animal? That's very tricky. And so Susie's going to tell us in our micro minute here uh, what's going on. How do you make blood without animals? Can we get a microphone going for you? We're going to see. We got blue here. All right. Yeah. All right, for our micro minute, um, we're going to go away from the bacteria realm and we're going to actually talk about a little thing called yeast. Um, many bakers know about yeast. You put yeast in dough, and what does it do to the dough? It makes it rise. How does it make it rise? There's fermentation process, oh, carbon sorry. dioxide is released, and then oh, it, I was gonna, uh, and then it makes it here. grow. I hear that. <laughs> Well, and it's used in some other fermentation processes. Well, yeasts are also used for another amazing thing. Um, they discovered in soybean plants, there are these little nodules at the bottom. And when you cut those nodules open, they are actually red. Well, what is inside there making it red is a legume hemoglobin. So it is made by the soybean plant. And what the scientists have done is they have taken out the DNA that makes that legume hemoglobin, and they've inserted it into the yeast. Now, yeast can produce pretty quickly, and so they use these yeast as vectors to create this uh, legume hemoglobin, and then they use that, and they put that in the Impossible Burger. And so that's what gives it the redness and the iron taste. So. Very good. Nice. And so it's actually very similar to animal blood, but it's made from plants. But you, to squeeze all of the little soybeans, uh, uh, plants, roots, they, they couldn't get enough. So they had to use uh, genetically modified organisms, which maybe some of you are worried about. I don't know, but they, um, that's how they do it. So everything is from plants, and it's including the genes that they're using to make blood. I thought that was really interesting. All right. Now, uh, one of the last topics here, uh, how amazing our iron is. Um, oh, you got yeah, we're out from up north here. But cars, rusting. Does that, does that happen here in Minnesota? <laughs> okay. So how do you get rid of the rust on your car? <laughs> Torch, what did you say? Throw it away the car and get a new one. Right? Sandblasting. I think this kid's for hire over here. Okay. In a few years, you two can run a sand. Yeah, you kind of got to get rid of the metal. Sandblaster. Do you do some sandblasting? A little bit? Yeah. So it's kind of, can you really unrust the car? No. You can't do that. Once your car rusts, we call, we call it the Michigan cancer. But it's maybe the Minnesota cancer. I don't know. Uh, once that cancer starts on your car, it's, that part's over. You have to cut it out. You have to put something new in there. And why is that? Because when you mix iron and oxygen, they do not want to let go because that's what rust is, iron plus oxygen. It doesn't want to let go. If we could get into the thermodynamics of all of this, but that reaction is natural right there. Iron plus oxygen, that's natural. It's going to rust. You get iron around, it's going to rust. And we see that on so many things around us. So how does the iron and the oxygen in the air not rust in your blood? That's the amazing miracle that is taking place. Well, it, it, it just happens. No, it's not just happening by chance. It is... The design of the hemoglobin holds the iron 
just far enough away and it's, pl it's blocked by other parts of the hemoglobin so that when oxygen comes in, it just connects just a little bit. Just a little bit, long enough for them to stay connected and to deliver the oxygen to where it's needed, the pressure changes, the oxygen is released. All of that happens thousands of times every day that hemoglobin is, is delivering this oxygen in a carefully controlled iron-oxygen relationship because if you left it the chance, oxygen would hit iron, it would rust, those blood cells are done, they couldn't do any more work, and they wouldn't let go of the oxygen. So it's amazing that our body is using iron to deliver oxygen because it should be rusty and it doesn't rust. And so the, uh, the red blood cells now, they're carrying it, they're running around, and after about uh, um, four months or so, they end up you know, eventually rusting and they have to get repaired and reused that we talked about earlier today. So all of this has to be torn down and you gotta be careful not to release the iron because the iron's very reactive and it wants to destroy other things. Now look at some of these numbers. There are, uh, each hemoglobin uh, takes about almost 2,000 trips every day. Going around, 2,000 2, trips, going through, picking up oxygen, letting it go, picking up oxygen, letting it go, picking up oxygen, letting it go, 2,000 times a day. Then you multiply it by about 100 days, and so it will, it will be reused about 200,000 times. That's pretty amazing. Let me show you what some scientists have done to try to make catalysts that carry things and make them reusable because really this is just it's just getting these uh, systems to be reusable you let it go and you pick it up so I did some research on reusing catalysts that use metals in a very similar experiment and I saw somebody was able to do it five times now remember blood does this 200,000 times and then it gets rid of it I've seen five times, five times, eight times, five times to reusing things that are very similar before the, the metal and you know, the things are not reusable anymore. Being able to reuse something in this kind of fashion is really hard and we don't have too good a clue of how to even do it. It just underscores the amazing technology that's in our blood. And so, uh, yeah, we already talked about this. It gets broken down and gets checked it's not working well or it's rusted inside it's broken down and the iron and all the other components are reused or recycled and sent out and eliminated so in order for blood to have evolved to get here it couldn't have picked up any other metals besides iron you would need that really big hemoglobin structure or otherwise uh, the uh, iron is not held properly and it will rust You've got to have, have a system to recycle all of that, and it has to happen fast enough, or you can't keep up with the blood and the, the organism's going to die, even a simple organism. So you need a way to destroy those uh, iron ions and uh, hemoglobin, or it will destroy everything else around it, because iron is very reactive in and of itself. And you can't store oxygen because it's too dangerous. So you can't just have a big lung that's holding on to oxygen, or it'll start to destroy that. Uh, extra lung if you had one that could do that. So one of the things I wanted to point, I wanted to make was that when we say something is naturally occurring, <laughs> that's kind of a funny word because uh, I don't see too many things that are natural about that. So all of these big machines that we see, they're huge chemical structures. And we talked about the probability. It is almost, it's beyond chance to make these things. So none of these are really uh, not naturally occurring. And anytime the machines are being made, they're highly regulated, and if something goes wrong, they're, they're activated to be destroyed, like using cap, says, cap paces and other things. A few things from Scripture about blood. The life is in the blood in this finely controlled system. For the life of the flesh, we can read in Leviticus, is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for your souls. Our blood is so precious. It is what's helping us to have life and stay awake and have energy. And we can see now how precious that is and why God used that as a, as a way to convey that life. When we see that and we can make atonement because it's, God made that thing, made our blood so precious, so precious. And to make atonement for our souls upon the altar, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. It needed to be something so precious 
in order to make atonement for the, our sins. So according to the law, in fact, nearly everything must be purified with blood, and without the, sh the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of, of sin. And we can read in Hebrews. And so, man, understanding how blood works and to keep it from rusting and how precious that is, we can understand why it was so precious for Jesus to spill his blood for us, but to have that sacrifice system, sacrificial system, and recognizing that it was so precious. And I hope we don't take it for granted uh, how precious our blood is. And we know it is, and I hope we can appreciate that even more. So one of the things I want you to, to recognize and understand that these are all tools inside of your body. No, they don't put away socks, but they help carry oxygen. No, they don't clean up you know, your underwear or put away your toys, but they are protecting us, repairing things and destroying things. You know, if we landed on a planet, let's say you went to one of these distant planets, and you went down there and you saw a saw, and you saw a drill, you saw my messy yard, no. and you saw all of these tools there, what would you think? That, was there somebody that had intelligence that was living around there? Yeah. But when we look and see all the amazing tools that are in every living system, including humans, but even all the way down in the bacteria, we say, ah, we, don't, we don't think anybody's there. That, that something else made those things. So if you see a working machine, I'm working on these new phrases here, so if you see a working machine, I think there's a master mechanic behind that. If you see a useful tool, there's probably some tool maker behind that. If you see things that are automated, there was probably an automation a production supervisor behind that. If you see messes are cleaned up, do your, your messes get cleaned up, you guys, by themselves? No. That means there must have been an engineer. You guys can call yourself engineers. You're a sanitation engineer cleaning up. If there is efficient organization, there is a conductor who is doing all of that. If there is some coordinated chemistry that is taking place, there must have been a head chemist doing all that. And if things are being recycled, then there's a recycler. And if you see a whole world full of these things, then you know there was a creator that made all of those things. And that's painting from Nathan Green, my buddy from Eau Claire Church. We go to church together, and he painted the seven day of creation. Who have seen these paintings? Quite a few of you. I think that was one of the other projects we have been working on. Uh, so Nathan had to consult with some scientists to put some equations and, and things in there. So I was one of them. And uh, I think there's some, I don't know if it's quite in there. On one of them, on I think day two, it was more with air and stuff. So uh, I do have talks with each one of those days too. So uh, a lot more to share on all of those things. So um, that's all I wanted to share. But I do have one more of my 10-minute videos or so that my group has made. Would you guys like to see that? I don't know, what time is supper, Pastor? In 10 minutes? Perfect. You guys, you guys want to see one more of these? Yeah. yeah, this one's pretty funny. This one's on cells and can cells form naturally. And I think you guys will enjoy it. And so uh, John will need some help rolling film there. Another conflicting requirement is that cells have to let water in. But if Ooh, water was just got... allowed to pour in willy-nilly, so would those sneaky tiny little protons. And this would drain the cells Hey, John, I think it needs to start from the beginning there. Yeah, I don't know if I, hopefully I got the right one in there. We're not, yeah, go. That's another problem we're not going to talk about. There we go. Just, yeah. Another conflicting requirement is that cells have to let oh, water stop in. it for a second. <laughs> oh, boy. I think I put in, uh, that was an earlier draft of one of our videos. I thought I put in the right one. If you just give me a second, I'll put the right one in. You did the right thing. Hang on a second here. Talk yourselves. Can we get on to um, YouTube? Let me just see this. Oh, okay. Well, you want to do that? Yeah, if you want to start that. Yeah, yeah. This may be it. Yeah, that's it, I think. Let me just unmute. Yep, that's it. 
Can, can I just show it from right here then? Like this, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. There we go. Yep. Six seconds. Ready? Okay, cool. Is it, is it showing? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, there we go. Charles Darwin and some modern scientists think that life started all on its own. It sort of just happened spontaneously. It's called chemical evolution. They say it started with chemicals forming building blocks and then combining into polymers like DNA and RNA. These previous videos detail just some of the scientific problems with that ever happening. Anyway, let's wave our little magic wand. <laughs> and say all those challenges have been solved for now. We don't have life yet, but what are the next steps toward life? Well, just like eggs have a hard time turning into a chicken without a shell, and water balloons are not much fun without the balloon, living things need a cozy little house of their own to keep the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. We're talking cell membranes. All living things are made up of cells that are surrounded by a cell membrane. Life simply cannot exist without membranes. Origin of Life researchers claim that cell membranes are easy to make and that they have demonstrated this in the lab. They point toward experiments where these molecules called phospholipids are placed in water and they form into a spherical shell, kind of like a cell membrane, all on their own. Wow. But is it really the case that cell membranes are so easy to form? Let's take a look more closely. Real quick. If you're new here, Long Story Short is about explaining science in an easily digestible way. If that sounds good to you, consider sharing this video with a friend and subscribing for more. Okay, cell membranes, needed for life, supposed to be easy to make. Is that the case? Membranes do a lot of essential things to keep the cell alive. If any are missing, death results. <gasps> Think of the membrane like a house in outer space. Uh, space house, nice. Space house provides a safe, comfortable environment inside despite things outside desperately wanting to kill you. Outside, the temperature can fluctuate between as hot as an oven and as cold as negative 455 degrees. You know, almost as cold as your ex's heart. Not to mention the radiation, lack of oxygen or water, there's a vacuum, space pirates. Inside though, there's an ample supply of pizza, tacos, warm blankies, that's what I'm talking about. The environment inside the house is controlled and very distinct from the outside. That's what keeps us alive. In a cell, the membrane is responsible for keeping things safe and comfy too. The fancy name for this is homeostasis. But walls that are sealed up tight with no way to let trash out or new food in will quickly become a stinky tomb. The cell will quickly die as food runs out and garbage piles up. The very simple membranes that scientists create in the lab are exactly like this, non-functional stinky tombs. Real cell membranes need to be tight, but also have very specific doors that actively let things in and out in order to maintain homeostasis. And it needs to have all of this complexity at the very beginning. There's no time for this to gradually evolve because no homeostasis, no life. What if early membranes were a bit leaky, like these papers suggest? Maybe the first cells had holes in them that were just big enough to let good things in and keep the bad stuff out. Somehow finding a good balance to maintain homeostasis. Unfortunately, that won't work. All existing cell membranes need to let big things in while at the same time keeping small things out. In other words, they have conflicting requirements. All cells harness their energy by pumping protons out and very carefully letting them back in to spin these proton turbines, like a hydroelectric power plant. And protons are teensy tiny. To give you a sense of scale, if a proton were the size of a housefly, then a bit that the cell would need to let in, like this amino acid histidine, would be roughly the size of the country of Monaco. And the smallest known cells would be roughly Sweden-sized. Those are the approximate scales that we're working with. Basically, Sweden would need to keep house flies out, while at the same time letting the Monaco sized things in. If the membrane let too many fly sized protons slip in, the cell would die. So the membrane has to be tight enough to not let these teensy weensy protons in, but
but also porous enough to be able to let these relatively gigantic things come right on in. These conflicting requirements of the membrane are a real head scratcher. Fun fact, at any given time, a cell is generating roughly the same voltage per meter across its membrane as a bolt of lightning. Another conflicting requirement is that cells have to let water in, but if water was just allowed to pour in willy-nilly, so would those sneaky tiny little protons, and this would drain the cell's battery, so to speak, and the cell would, again, die. Thankfully, cells have specialized doors called aquaporins. They work sort of like an airlock in our space house by safely letting things in without destroying the nice environment inside. The aquaporin lets water molecules in single file, but that still wouldn't be enough to stop the protons from sneaking in and killing the cell, because the water acts sort of like a wire, conducting the protons along itself. So the aquaporin also rotates each water molecule by 90 degrees, flipping them around and eliminating its ability to conduct protons for just long enough to safely let the water inside. Every cell has tons of these incredibly specialized doors, the simplest known free-living life form is a single-celled guy called Mycoplasma genitalium, but it has thousands of specialized doors composed of over a hundred different proteins that operate within the cell membrane. So even the simplest cell has an extraordinarily complex membrane, an active, selectively permeable boundary that allows and often forces exactly the right things in and out to maintain homeostasis a perfect environment inside the cell, despite wildly varying conditions outside. Leaky membranes and tight membranes would both kill the cell. The membrane had to be extremely complex from the very beginning, or life could never begin. Well, yeah, today it's very complex, but there's been a lot of time for things to evolve. When life was just getting started, there weren't cells, there were proto-cells. They were way simpler. Okay, could life have been simpler? Scientists try to gauge what the simplest possible life form could have been by taking a very simple cell and removing as many things as possible without killing it. These papers took a very simple bacterial cell that had about 985 genes and cut it down to 474 genes. But the bug was barely hanging on, so they added a few genes back in to get a cell that was more reasonably alive. They found 493 genes were essential to keep the minimal cell alive. This work suggests that there is a practical boundary for how simple life can possibly be, not just today, but at any point in time. But in order to cut that many genes from the original 985, they essentially had to coddle the poor hobbled little bacteria. You see, the original bacteria was able to make its own food from what was around it, like a big boy but the downsized bacteria needed someone else to make his PB&J for him. And he was picky. He needed it cut into triangles and had a crust cut off. Dad, how many times do you have to tell It required a precise cocktail of nutrients, basically life support, or else it would die. However, most of these life support nutrients couldn't have existed on a prebiotic earth. If you try to simplify a living organism, removing some of its tools for survival, it doesn't just magically no longer need that thing. The only way to keep it alive is to place a heavier burden for survival on the surrounding environment. The organism just becomes more genetically fragile, unable to endure slight environmental changes, or it'll become dependent on other life forms to keep it alive, which, if you're paying attention, is not a possibility for the first living thing. Consider yourself. Could you live without legs? Technically, yes. But more requirements will be placed on your environment. You will need a wheelchair, ramps to go up or down, and nice smooth surfaces. Or robot leg. Can you live without kidneys? Technically, yes. But you will need to be hooked up to a sophisticated dialysis machine to do what your kidneys do. Three times a week for three to five hours per day for the rest of your life. The more you remove from a person to simplify them, the more requirements are placed on the environment to keep them alive. The same is true for microscopic life. These experiments don't actually do away with needed complexity, it's just exported to the environment. Real cell membranes are complex machines with many required functions, like identifying needed molecules and opening specific doors to let them in or force them in. 
identifying waste and exporting it, maintaining proper pH, salinity, and osmotic pressure, blocking toxins no. and dangerous invaders, <laughs> providing no. electrical insulation, energy okay. harnessing, and even acting as a template for expanding the membrane during replication because cells can't actually build a membrane from scratch. They need a pre-existing membrane to do that. The lab-made membranes, on the other hand, do literally none of these this things. The thing They're closer to dumb soap bubbles or salad dressing than anything else. When scientific literature or textbooks claim that membranes are easy to create in the lab, it's a lot like saying the Mona Lisa is easy to draw. Or making some dinosaur-shaped chicken nuggies is equivalent to making real actual dinosaurs. There's a bit of a difference there. The observable science makes it clear that, one, because of the need for homeostasis and the conflicting requirements of cells, the membrane had to be extremely complex right from the very beginning, or life could never have begun. Claims that this problem is even close to being solved are badly misrepresenting the science. And two, attempting to simplify a living organism merely kicks the can down the road. These experiments only hide the complexity by exporting it to the environment. And a prebiotic environment was certainly not like a lab or hospital ICU. So, when you hear protocell, think leprechaun or rainbow unicorn. There is no evidence that any of these ever existed. And the more science learns about life, the more unscientific chemical evolution becomes. A lot of amazing points there. Does that seem like a simple cell? And that was the simplest cell. They're very complex. And it's not so complex that we don't understand what's going on there anymore. We know what's going on now when we realize, look at all these machines that are there. When we see machines in our level, we go, there was somebody there. But we see machines at that level like, oh, that, we, we don't know how they got there, but we know. We know that all of those things have been orchestrated by a loving God who wants to support everything, even down to the little bacteria and all the way up to us. So let's just end with prayer to thank him. You got something else? Or Oh, do we have another special music? Or something? And so I will turn it over to Pastor Booth. All right, thank you. Blessed to have Ted sing for us again today. And um, he's one of our favorite musicians. There's right. people, that, that's, there are people that ask for him. They, they email me and they say, when's that Elvis guy going to sing again? All right. <laughs> Amen. Well, this presentation was a lot like Rust, wasn't it? <laughs> and um, this song basically... Um, it is well, it is well with my soul, even mm. though we have a lot of rust going on in our lives. When like a river attendeth my way when sorrow like sea billows roll my lot thou hast taught This glorious thought 
my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to his cross and I bear probably did this five, six, seven times now. the day when my face shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so Let's ask for the blessing. Father, we thank you so much for this, um, this uh, afternoon siesta, Lord, with you. Get to rest in our soul as well with you, Lord. Also, thank you for the food we're going to eat now, Lord. Thank you for those who have come to spend time together in your house with your people. This is where we are blessed, Lord. This is where we are sanctified. This is where we become more like our maker. Bless us, Lord, for it is well with our soul. In Jesus' name, amen.